Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, pleasure to be here and not back in Cleveland. I kind of shoveled my walk this morning before going to the airport, and uh, I'm just glad I was coming here rather than New York or New Jersey and seeing all those canceled notices on the boards in the airport. What I want to do today, um, briefly, and I'll remind myself to say briefly because I'm a law professor, which means I can go on for a very long time, um, is to suggest that a lot of the ways we think about environmental protection are good discussion. And our general assumption that environmental protection and free market economics are in conflict represents a misunderstanding of how best to achieve the environmental goals and advance the environmental values that I'm sure most of us share. Now, I live in Cleveland now. So if I talk about the environment, I have to say a little bit about my own adopted city's role in the history of environmental protection in this country. Um, we are the site of the Cuyahoga River. Um, and some of you, this may be, some of you may remember this, some of you, uh, this may be a bit before you were born, but uh, on the morning of June 22nd, 1969, uh, some oil and debris floating on the surface of the river caught fire and it became something of an event. It was covered in Time Magazine, which published this photo. Uh, it was memorialized in a song by Randy Newman. Um, some of you may know him for like writing theme songs from like Disney movies and stuff. Um, but he wrote a, a, a song with the, with the refrain, Burn On, Big River, Burn On. Uh, it was also uh, referenced in the R.E.M. song. Uh, so noted in the National Geographic and New York Times, very quickly became a symbol of the growing environmental movement, a sign to many people of how bad our environment had become because of the failure of existing legal and other institutions to protect the world around them. When I moved to Cleveland, I was really interested in the story. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's a remarkable story, produced some remarkable visuals. And what I found was a bit problematic. Start with the picture. This is the picture that Time Magazine published in 1969. It was the same issue that covered the Apollo moon landing, so lots of people saw it. It ran a, a, a story about the nation's environmental crisis that talked about how the Cuyahoga River was a river so dirty that it oozed uh, and mentioned the fire of June 22nd. The problem, though, is that this picture is not of the June 22nd. It's a picture that's appeared lots of places, including in the EPA's, the Environmental Protection Agency's own internal magazine, as a picture of the June 22nd fire. But it isn't a picture of that fire. Uh, this is the closest we have to a picture of the June 22nd fire. I'm told if you get a really, really good version of this picture, that down in this corner you can see some wisps of smoke. The problem is the fire was out within 30 minutes out before photographers were able to show up, out before the video cameras arrived. The story of a river on fire, though, was something that seemed too good to pass up, and Time Magazine apparently decided to run with it anyway. The obvious question is, well, where did this picture come from? I mean, that is a picture. It is of the Cuyahoga River. It's just not from 1969. It turns out it's from 1952 when there was a real fire, the sort of fire from which legends are made, a fire that caused well over a million dollars of damage, a fire that had it not occurred on a weekend would almost certainly have resulted in substantial loss of life, a fire that, unlike the, the little story we saw in 1969, produced the banner headline in the local press. The interesting thing, though, is if we want to talk about fires in the Cuyahoga River, we can talk about the fire in 1952, we can talk about fires from the 1930s, we can talk about fires from the 1910s. We can go all the way back to the late 19th century and the days of Standard Oil's uh, uh, rise and its, its prominence when fires were something of a regular occurrence on the Cuyahoga River. And we can talk not just about the Cuyahoga River, we can talk about rivers in Detroit, in Columbus, in Philadelphia, in New York, in Baltimore. In fact, we can talk about industrial rivers throughout the United States that in the late 1930s early 20th century burned with some regularity because we didn't know what to do with many of the residuals that were that resulted from various oil and chemical production, in Cleveland's case, oil and uh, 
chemical and paint production. Uh, and in many cases, there weren't protections, and so folks would simply deposit them on a river. Many rivers were thought of as having their highest and best use as being a place for commerce, a way to transport goods, and secondarily, a place to dispose of waste. By 1969, it's not that things have gotten so bad that a river could finally burn on, catch on fire. By 1969, we've actually forgotten that this had been a common problem throughout most of, much of the country, a problem that had been solved. Because people realized if rivers burn, boats burn, docks burn, goods burn, people get hurt, people don't want to live in your city, it's not a problem you want to have. And so in Cleveland and many other places, local communities took action to make sure that this problem did not continue. But unfortunately, this, you know, this picture is the one we remember, and, and it encapsulates to me a lot of what the problems are when we talk about environmental policy. We misunderstand the nature of the problems, where they come from, and what the solution is. We normally think of, when we talk about environmental policy, I, characterize the standard fable that things finally got so bad that we had an Earth Day in 1970, the federal government was called into the rescue, we enacted lots of regulations, and then finally things started to get The problem with that story, as with the case of the Cairo River, is that a lot of environmental problems, those that were most obvious, those that we most knew how to do something about, actually started getting better before the Earth Day in 1970, before the federal government enacted a wide range of federal environmental statutes before we enacted lots of comprehensive environmental regulations. And the other part of that story is a lot of the regulations that we've enacted, while well-intentioned, while serving goals that I think most of us, not all of us, share, don't really do what we might want them to do. So let me explain a little bit about why I might say that. Let's, well, this first in terms of things getting better, I've done a lot of work on wetlands. Um, in the post-war period, net wetland losses in this country went from a point in time where we were losing 800,000 acres of wetlands in a year to by the mid-1990s, we had no net loss of wetlands. Now this is measured in acreage, and we obviously care about more than acreage of wetlands. We care about ecological function, but this is the best data of the sort we have. In terms of what's going on in this time period, one of the things that's going on is per acre crop production doubles possible to grow more stuff on less land, there's less pressure to convert wetlands as a farmer. Something else that's interesting in terms of is that federal regulation is relatively late in the story. The Clean Water Act isn't interpreted to cover wetlands until the mid-1970s. Limits aren't placed on the use of federal agricultural subsidies for the draining of wetlands until the 1980s. Major loopholes in federal regulations aren't even attempted to be addressed until the 90s. State regulation, though, begins in the 1960s. Local regulation begins even before that in the efforts of conservation groups to purchase and protect wetlands because of the ecological functions they provide, can provide, begins even earlier than that. But we can talk about air pollution. We can look at air pollution trends. This is a fun data chart. This is concentrations of sulfur dioxide, concentrations of, of pollutant that we knew was a pollutant relatively early, uh, and concentrations were falling before adoption of the Clean Air Act. 1970, they were actually falling faster before 1970 than after. That's not because the regulations slowed it down, it's because it's generally easier to clean, to, to uh, the first increments of cleanup are generally easier than later ones because there are dimension marginal returns. But there are, can show you more stuff that show for environmental problems that we recognize as such, a lot of positive trends began before the regulations were adopted. Flip side of that story is, well, what have the regulations done? And sometimes they've done some good things. Lead phase, two phase out of gasoline. Tremendous benefit for human health. Tremendous environmental benefit to take lead out of gasoline and reduce human exposure to that. We have a lot of environmental laws that, because they're based on a misunderstanding about how we should think about environmental problems, don't always produce the sort of results you'd like. So what I'd like to talk about uh, it's the Native Species Act because I can show fun pictures. Um, uh, and it unfortunately makes this point in fairly stark terms. The Native Species Act was enacted in 1973. The purpose of the law is to identify those species of flora and fauna that are in trouble, those that are in danger of going extinct, 
and to find ways to protect them. Some folks have, have, have compared the Endangered Species Act. It's like, it operates like an emergency room. When you're put on the endangered list, you're in the emergency room. Our goal is to get you out. Our goal is to say the species is no longer in danger. It no longer needs extraordinary assistance. Well, since the Endangered Species Act has been enacted, over 1,800 species have been listed. So over 1,800 species have been identified as being threatened or endangered, being at risk of extinction. Last time I updated this, this data was several months ago, but the overall magnitude just hasn't changed. In that period, since 1973, we've only delisted, we've only taken off the list several dozen. Last time I checked it was 58. It's probably a few, a few higher than that. It's probably 60 or 61 by today, but still well below 100. Of the 1,800 plus species we put into the emergency room, we've been able to check out 58, but it's actually worse than that. Because there are several reasons you can come off the list. One reason, the reason we want to take you off the list is the species is doing better. Populations are stable or expanding. They're no longer in danger of extinction. But sometimes species are taken off the list because they go extinct. And sometimes because we made a mistake. We thought something was a distinct species when it wasn't, or we didn't realize how many there were. The snail darter that uh, held up the Teleco Dam for a long period of time, it turned out the snail darter was more abundant than we realized. It didn't only live in that small part of the Tennessee River and other places. Um, so when the Teleco Dam, Teleco Dam was finally built, that, that fish did not go extinct. Uh, after all, um, sometimes we just do our knowledge as a group. We don't know precisely how many of the species there might be or how uh, proud they are. Well, about two dozen have actually been taken off the list because they got better, because they're no longer in the extinction. The rest were taken off because they were data errors or they went extinct. And I've looked at those two dozen, and when you look at them, it's not clear we can even really credit many of those with as successes of the Native Species Act. That we can credit the Native Species Act with really saving those species. I think an argument can be made that we don't have a single species that has been recovered because of the protections provided by the laws regulations. The reason I say that is just to point out some examples, we have a bunch of birds, brown pelican, arctic peregrine, peregrine falcon, that were undoubtedly helped by the banning of DDT. There's certainly the widespread use of DDT, DDT can never be overused. Um, and that caused getting of eggshells for many birds. That was banned in 1972 before the Native Species Act was even enacted. We have species like the red kangaroo. I understand it's doing better. They're, they're in Australia, though. So um, whatever it is that's helping them, it's not the United States Native Species Act. There, there are several birds on the island of Palau which didn't take too well to having their habitat uh, be a war zone during World War II. And in the decades since, they certainly recovered as their habitat did. But the Native Species Act did not. With that, there's a, if any of you have been to uh, make the drive all the way down to Key West, you may know that there are places, there's a deer protected there, there's a, there's a deer, uh, a similar uh, small deer species that was helped by predator control on federal land. But when you go for all these, these two dozen species, what you don't find, you don't find one that was held by the primary regulatory provisions of the Act. The provisions that say to private landowners, if we find a species on your land, or we think your land is suitable habitat for an endangered species, we're going to regulate your use of that land so that that habitat is not lost. And that's a problem because about two-thirds of listed species rely upon private land for some or all of their habitat. If we don't protect them on private land, a lot of species won't get protected, and we can't identify a single success out of over 800 species from those provisions. It's certainly great that a deer was saved because federal land managers realized that predator control might on federal land to help it. But there aren't that many species we can see with those sorts of measures with simply exercising better stewardship of federal properties. 
of being negotiated on private land, and the Indian Free Speech Act isn't doing that. In terms of why that is, well, Sam Hamilton, who was uh, uh, the administrator for the state of Texas for the Fish and Wildlife Service, and Texas is notable for this because Texas has relatively little federal land um, in, this, in, this, uh, in terms of the percentage of its area, it's far more dominated by private property. He was also subsequently head of the Fish and Wildlife Service in the Obama administration. The way he characterized these incentives are wrong. We're not paying attention to the incentives this law creates. If I have a rare metal on my property, its value goes up. Or in Texas, he probably should have said, if I, have, if I find oil on my property or gas on my property, the value goes up. But if a rare bird occupies the land, its value disappears. He made these comments because he was watching what was happening in Texas when there were efforts to protect bird species like the black cat period. And private landowners were discovering that if they were good stewards of the land and the birds showed up, what would follow would be regulatory restrictions? A requirement of law that says if you want to modify your land in a way that could alter, destroy, or simply modify the habitat of those species, you need a federal permit. And that permit may impose all sorts of conditions, and that's going to have a negative impact on your land value turning something that should be an asset to a landowner into a liability. Some academics thought this was quite interesting and decided to look into it in more detail. We know some empirical studies documenting this effect and how widespread it can be. We have a couple studies looking at red-cockaded woodpeckers in the southeastern United States. Red-cockaded woodpeckers are cavity nesting species. They like older trees in which they can build their homes. And so they need trees to be standing for a long period of time. Well, what researchers discovered when they looked at what happened once the red cockaded woodpecker was listed as endangered is that private landowners, timber owners in particular, systematically began cutting their timber earlier. Red cockaded, the red cockaded woodpecker needs old trees. If you cut your trees before they're sufficiently old, the woodpeckers don't shut up, don't show up. The regulations don't follow. Over time, though, that means red cockaded woodpecker loses habitat because there aren't the next generation of older trees to replace the one before. And they found, sure enough, the presence of woodpeckers meant earlier cutting of trees. Timber companies and private timber owners cutting trees at an act, to, not to maximize the economic value in terms of value to timber, but cutting it earlier at their own expense, losing money or at least sacrificing some of the profits they could have made to avoid the regulatory impact of the woodpecker shrimp. Another study in conservation biology looking at the pebbled meadow jumping mouse, another native species, found that when, when surveying landowners, that landowners, just as many landowners might be inclined to say, I might do something else that species, just as many said, no, I'm, gonna, I'm not. I'm less likely to work with a conservation group or work with the government or work with environmental delta species if it's listed. Again, because of the regulatory restrictions that follow. Even worse, the majority of landowner surveyed said they would not even allow biologists on their land anymore to do, to do population surveys. Because they were afraid that if the animals are found, the regulations would follow. A law that's designed to protect species, a law that is intended to protect species, the majority of which need habitat on private land to survive is instead fairly systematically making landowners enemies of the species that rely upon their land. It does so because it ignores the incentives that are created by the way the regulations are. Now we can talk about some other ways of trying to protect uh, wildlife. And for that, I remember the order of my slide, we'll talk about elephants for a little bit. Elephants are really cool. Um, what we often refer to this charismatic megafauna. Just a fancy way of saying big, cute animal. Big animal that we like. Um, they're large. They have really interesting and sophisticated uh, community behaviors. Um, behaviors that, 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 are, that are quite complex. Um, I think a lot of us think they're worth saving because they're neat. Because they're, they're something really special. A lot of people, when they think of elephants, they don't necessarily think of them as charismatic megafauna. They think of ivory. They think of what can be done with the tusks. Use for 
for jewelry to use because some people believe maybe if you do something with it, it has some additional purposes. For people that live near an old fence, they might be thought of as a third and a third as a competitor for land. Something that can trample your crops, spoil your water, perhaps even trample your loved ones. I had a colleague that spent some time in Southern Africa doing research on elephant conservation, came back with a stack of news reports of events of people getting hurt by elephants, stampedes, or whatever else. It's really easy for us in this room to think about preserving elephants because we don't really have them in our backyard. And we don't bear the costs of that. Well, the approach that, the dominant approach to thinking about how to protect elephants, the approach that was urged by most major environmental organizations for quite some time, was very similar to the idea of the Endangered Species Act. We have to figure out a way to prevent human interference of modification of the habitat, prevent human actions that may directly harm the species, we'll regulate it, we'll wall it off, we'll create parks, and so on prevent human activity that may harm elephants. It was the dominant approach that was used in most African countries, most notably it was used in Kenya, uh, and from 1975 to 1995, elephant populations were cut by about three quarters. In Zimbabwe, didn't have the resources of Kenya, didn't have the financial aid Kenya got, didn't have the parks, didn't have the relatively, this is relative, relatively sophisticated governmental uh, bureaucracies and the like to enforce these sorts of rules, Zimbabwe adopted a very different approach. Zimbabwe said, you know, elephants are worth something. Some people want an ivory. Some people want hide. Some people just want the chance to take a picture. Some people want to go on on. And that makes the elephants valuable. That makes the land that elephants depend on valuable as elephant habitat. Zimbabwe was, by not getting the farm aid again, was getting not having the resources in it, was getting so on, saw the exact opposite trend. Its elephant population went from 45,000 to 65,000 over that same 20 year period. Rather than walling elephants off, rather than separating them from economic activities, Zimbabwe said there have to be incentives for people to want to protect. You can create a park in some remote rural area. You can put a bounty on poachers. You can prohibit people from shooting them. But for a villager that lives in a poor community that doesn't have good education, that doesn't have good health care, that doesn't have a reliable source of power or reliable source of clean water, check from a poacher, should say check, cash from a poacher, look the other way, it's very appealing. But when that local community realizes that that elephant it might be the source of safari revenue, it might be the source of revenue from Southern Africa. That elephant is now something valuable. That community is going to care a lot about that elephant. And it's not going to be as interested in the country. And that's exactly what happened in Zimbabwe. What was even more significant over this 20 year period, though, oops, I don't know why I'm actually doing that. There we go. Um, is what happened to the landscape. Is, it wasn't just a question of elephant numbers, it was a question of what happened on the landscape. In 1975, it was estimated about 12% of Zimbabwe was suitable habitat for elephants. 20 years later, as a result of these programs, that, land, that had almost doubled. Which meant that not only were elephants benefited because they now had value, but all the species that relied upon similar habitat, the species that you couldn't charge a wealthy American thousands of dollars to come on or take a picture of, were benefiting too. In Zimbabwe, you had ranchers that had been grazing cattle, taking down their fences, getting rid of the cows, and restoring their land to its habitat because that was, could now be a source of revenue. Whereas before, the trend had been move out the wildlife and either do cattle or crops. Now, some of you may know, in the late 90s, the dictator of Zimbabwe kind of went over the edge, and a lot of these gains were lost. But we saw over this period two very different approaches to conservation in two radically different patterns of success. And it's something that we see in other areas. If we look around the world at those resources that are in the most trouble, water resources in much of the world, tropical forests, 
most, most ocean fisheries. And in the United States, non-domesticated wildlife, wildlife like those that are supposed to be protected under the Endangered Species Act, we see resources that are in trouble. And they all, and, and are, we, on the other hand, look at resources that aren't so much in trouble. Resources that we're not worried about running out of. The United States, at least, most mineral resources, temperate forests, which have been stable and growing, particularly in countries like the United States, fisheries that are managed under what are called ITQs or other cat share property based instruments, and aquaculture, domesticated wildlife in the United States and exotics. We see a pattern. And something very similar to what we saw in Sub Saharan Africa with regard to elephant conservation. Those resources that we manage through politics, that we manage through regulatory measures, or that are simply left in the commons tend to be those that are most stressed, most poorly managed, most in need of conservation. Whereas those resources that we've figured out ways of integrating into our economic institutions and into our market institutions are those that we are least worried about. Because we have aligned, we have done a better job at least of aligning incentives for the conservation. Um, some of you may be familiar with the show Deadliest Catch. Who's ever seen that show? Okay. Um, so Deadliest Catch actually is, is, is a great story about this. Right? So it's really great reality TV because you've got to go out and catch a lot of fish in these rough waters, and you've got to do it really quickly because the, when the show began, the rules were the fishery was open until the catch limit for the fishery was reached, and then the whole thing gets shut down. So everybody races to catch as much as they can, as quickly as they can. And you don't worry about bycatch. You don't worry about catching non-target species. You don't worry about the effects we have on other things. You don't worry about uh, the environmental effects. What happened on this fishery, what's happened on a bunch of fisheries, is they switched to something called catch shares. They switched, or what some people refer to as ITQs. They said, you know, this is nuts. Catching a year's worth of, of a given fish species or, or crab or whatever it is you're, you're in, in a week, this is going on in some fisheries. It's not, maybe it may be for good reality TV. It's crazy for the safety of the fishermen. It's crazy for the quality of the catch. It's crazy for conservation. That's not how you ensure sustainable utilization of a reason. So it's been done in a fishery that's uh, that is catch for that is catch is takes place and has been done on a bunch of fisheries, several dozen fisheries around the world, is those who participate in the fishery were actually given property rights in the fishery, given a portion of the catch that is theirs, that they can sell, they can lease, that they own from year to year. So if the fishery is healthier next year than it is this year, the value of their share grows. And what we found in those fisheries is that those fisheries do better. Not only are uh, the catch limits enforced more effectively, participants in those fisheries now have a stake in how those fisheries are managed. And New Zealand in particular and Iceland uh, have been very aggressive in using this approach with tremendous success. I don't remember if I, I didn't even see the slide, so I'll say a little bit more about this. Um, we found a whole bunch of things. We found fishermen caring about bycatch, caring about non-target species caring about whether or not other folks in the fishery are cheating on their shares, caring about safety. What the deadliest catch had to do is they had to get the guys on the show to make bets so they could restore the excitement of their first season after this was, instrument, after this was implemented. Because there was no longer, the deadliest catch wasn't so deadly anymore after this reform was put in place. And it was a problem, at least the problem with the show. It wasn't a problem. Fishery wasn't a problem for the folks that, that lose lives and livelihoods in their lives. Major studies published in science showing that looking around the world, the fisheries that are managed through property rights institutions like cash shares are far less likely to be declined, far less likely to be at risk than those that are either completely left in, 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 as open access commons or those that are managed by traditional regulation. And this isn't something that should surprise us. Gary Hardin's 1968 essay, Tragedy of the, Com of the Commons, which popularized the notion of the commons, pointed out that where we have property rights, the tragedy of the commons is averted. 
question he raised was, how do we apply property rights to lots of environmental resources? Well, he was very clear that where we can do it, the problem is solved. In our experience with fisheries, like what we saw with elephants in Africa, like what we've seen many other resources, illustrates that point. Now, we don't only care about conserving resources, we also care about the harms that economic activity and that individual activity can, can have on other people, can have on the world around us. We care about pollution just like we care about conserving resources. And there we should care about the value that property rights can, can provide as well. One reason we should care about property rights is that, and, and, and markets in general, is we care about the general incentives that they create for resource use. Markets and competition create very powerful incentives to do something less in a less costly way than your competitor, to do more with less, to be more efficient. And that produces substantial environmental gains. A lot of the things that used to get dumped into the Cuyahoga River, people have realized because they were driven by market pressures to be more competitive, to find ways to make more profit, they found, hey, that what we used to think was waste is actually something we can do something with. And that's something that's done quite a bit. When we, when we look at what occurs in the marketplace, it also creates tremendous incentives to do more with less. One of my favorite examples is this. And then half the people in the room probably don't even might not know what it is or why it's important, but that's copper wires. Before about half of you were born, that's how we talked to each other. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have fiber optics. Help them through copper wire. Well, why is that important? Well, because copper is expensive, but it's also really intensive and environmentally intensive to create copper wire. You've got to dig the copper out of the ground. You have to smelt it. Here's a not a great picture, but a picture of a copper operation. I don't think you've ever been to either a copper mine or a copper smelter. I mean, it's not where you want to go on vacation, right? It was producing something really important and really valuable, but a tremendous environmental loss. Scarring the landscape, producing all sorts, producing all sorts of toxins and pollutants in the atmosphere when, when the copper is processed. Well, eventually people realized, you know, there might be other cheaper, more efficient ways of communicating. So you got this, fiber optics. Fiber optics come from sand. From sand. I'm not worried about running out of silica. There was a period of time where we were worried about running out of copper because we had this insatiable demand for communication and copper wire was the way we were going to do it. And instead we replaced it with something that's more efficient, transmits far more with far less. This, economically, this was an incredible boon, but it was an environmental boon as well because that, a lot of that economic savings was we, we could communicate more Relying on less material, material that's easier to get, less environmentally destructive to get, less environmentally intensive to use. And I'll, and I'll have to come up with a new example for this because now, I mean, now we don't even necessarily use stuff. I mean, we use stuff, sure, but far less because so much of our communication isn't even going through a physical medium. Again, the incentive was how can I use more cheaply? The incentive wasn't how do I do it in a more environmentally friendly way. It wasn't because regulations said you can't do this. It was because people wanted to figure out how to do more with less. Because market competition drives folks to try and do that. And again, the environmental boots uh, were tremendous. I have a friend, Lynn Scarlett, who was uh, assi uh, an assistant secretary of the interior, who used to do this talk with a soda can. And she's, she's a, a, a fairly small, very thin woman. Rip a can in half. And depending on the age of the audience, she talked about, you know, can people do that when they were a kid? Because one of the things she points out is the amount of aluminum it takes to make something like a soda can is a fraction of what it was 34 years ago. Because that same incentive encouraged us to figure out how can we make a can that doesn't break, that does what it's supposed to do, but that requires less material. Same sort of story as the story with, with communication. 
Now, of course, the drive to do things less expensively does sometimes encourage folks to figure out, well, how can I, if I'm going to create lots of dumps, if I'm going to have lots of waste, is there a way that I can do something with it that's cheap? And sending it off to a landfill, or paying somebody to take it, or treating it so it's less harmful, those things might not be cheap. And if you can just dump it somewhere, well, maybe you'll try and do that. One of the things I think we've forgotten in terms of thinking about pollution and property rights is that part of the point of property rights, certainly in our legal tradition, has been that they are protected from that sort of malfeasance. Just as my right to swing my hand or swing my fist ends at your nose, my right to use my property is constrained by the fact that I have neighbors that could be affected. When I teach property or environmental law to my students, I talk about William Allred's case, which is an old common law case from 1611. First reported case that we know that, that talks about this principle. A story that could be out of, you know, could be from North Carolina today. One property owner decided he wanted to raise some pigs. A lot of pigs, or a lot of pigs for 1611. Pigs smell. When you have a lot of pigs in close quarters, it might not be so nice to live next door. So his neighbor said, I'm affected by the stench, I'm affected by the smell. Essentially, I'm affected by the pollution of your agricultural operation. You should stop. They go to court. The pig owner says, I'm providing a very important service to the community. I am feeding people. Your sensitive nose should not get in the way of my providing this valuable service, providing people with food to eat. The court in 1611 says this Latin thing, which I never took Latin, so I can't really pronounce it. But that's why I just say sicudere. It's the sicudere tool. Aluminum non latest, I think. But what it means is you can only use your property so you don't harm your neighbors. You're allowed to raise pigs, but if it effectively drives your neighbor out of his home, you violate your neighbor's property. Part of the problem that we experienced in this country in the 20th century with pollution is we really forgot about this principle. And when it came time to start adopting regulations, we Instead of trying to reinforce this principle, say to a factory, hey, look, you can have a factory, but you've got to figure out a way to have a factory that you're not poisoning those that live downwind. And so we stopped enforcing this principle, and in many cases adopt regulations that said what matters are not whether or not you hurt your neighbor, but whether or not you can file the right permit. And that produces a lot of the same sort of perverse incentives that we would expect. People care more about the paperwork than they do about the pollution. We both simultaneously over control some types of environmental effects and under control others because we've forgotten that just as property rights and create incentives for individuals to steward things and to take care of them and to increase their value over time, if protected, they enable individuals to protect areas against against others, require each of us to use our property in ways that minimize the harm to those around us. In terms of what this should look like, is we should be protecting property rights against external harm. We should be focusing on the harm and what causes it, not on things like permits. The Supreme Court, a US Supreme Court case that says an individual can sue a company for violating the Clean Water Act even if they cannot document any effect on the water whatsoever. All they need to show is the permit violated. In a lot of jurisdictions, if the permit is complied with, it doesn't matter what the effects are. That's backwards. What we should care about is the property owner using their property in a way that affects those downstream or downwind. We want to consider context. Traditional protection of property rights under the nuisance law always took into account that there's a difference between a factory in an industrial area and a factory in a residential neighborhood. 
that what constitutes a harm, particularly if we're talking about things that aren't measurable as health effects and the like, depends on the context in which it is. And we won't go out for bargaining. You look at the early 20th century and the birth of what we now refer to as industrial ecology, you see in many cases industrial landowners realizing that if they're going to operate a particular way, it's worth their while to figure out, well, are there neighbors that might care and can we negotiate with them and come up with some sort of understanding? Factories require the foreman of the factory to live in the closest second window house to assure the community that the foreman is not exposing the community to anything that the foreman is not willing to expose his own family to as a way of ensuring people, the people that the foreman is doing his best in terms of how to operate the facility. Allow these sorts of negotiations, and this certainly encourages innovation. If my choice is treating something so I don't harm my neighbors or turning it into something valuable, and those are really my only choices. Paying disposable waste or making it something valuable, well, I have much greater incentive to find something to, to make a productive use of it and less environmental use of it. Um, so, kind of coming back to where we started, a lot of times we think about the environment, we would think about there's a market failure. Markets are great, they give us cell phones, think pads, and all kinds of, and iPads, and all kinds of fun stuff. But to shame the inhabitant, terrible impact on the world. And so it's a market failure that, while having markets, causes all these problems. But when we look at non market societies, we don't find a lack of environmental problems. In fact, in many cases, we find environmental problems that are much worse. And when we look at our own environmental problems, what I think we tend to find is not that markets are failing, but in real respect, we fail to have markets. We fail to have the institutions property rights, voluntary exchange, protected by the rule of law, that markets will have, but that also that successful conservation relies upon. If it were up to me, if whoever our next president is like, call me up and say, hey, what should I do? It's not gonna happen, but if it did, I would say, well, here's some things you should do. Here are some ways to get environmental policy back on track. First thing you should do is first do no harm. It's crazy how much our federal government spends doing great problems that then has to regulate all of us to fix. I'm in Florida, so I probably won't have to say too much about that because south of here, there's a whole lot of the state that has experienced that. What's going on with that in the Everglades? We can talk about agricultural subsidies throughout the country. We can talk about all sorts of programs. Programs that have helped contribute to the endangered species programs that have encouraged their evolution water pollution that penalize efforts to replace older, dirtier technology with newer, cleaner ones. Federal government should first do no harm. Next thing we want to do is we want to try and find ways of expanding market institutions. We want to find ways of expanding property rights. Do things like what was done with fisheries. Find ways of giving those that use a resource a stake in the long-term health and sustainability of that resource and protect it. We want to build on common markets. I don't believe that simply throwing all pollution problems back to the court solves them all. But I think that those old court cases, like that one from 1611 that I mentioned, embody certain principles, which are the sorts of things that regulation should build upon and replicate, rather than preempt or displace. If it's hard to figure, to, to figure out how, what, what factory is the source of pollution in a given place, well then maybe the rules should focus on how we make sure we can Trace the pollutants to their source and document the source of the problem. We do that with explosives. Why wouldn't we do that with pollutants? That makes a lot more sense than requiring everyone to fill out permits that may have nothing to do with actual environmental harm. I think we also want to decentralize this issue. Environmental problems are tough, they're hard. We've tried a lot of things in this country to advance environmental protection, and not all of it's worked. And I think a lot of environmental problems, especially those that are local or regional, would benefit from local or regional experimentation. But in all cases, we need to recognize the, the importance of institutions, the institutions that work so well in other contexts, market institutions, and recognize the incentives they create. Recognize that if you punish people for doing the right thing, whether it's telling a landowner, if you've managed your land so that endangered species show up, we're going to regulate your land, 
or whether we tell a factory owner, if you replace an old cold boiler with some new, relatively clean natural gas fiber turbine, we're going to impose greater regulations on you. But either way, those are the sorts of incentives you create. You're not going to get what you want. And too often, we've enacted laws just thinking that good intentions, having them all in the books, was what would matter, rather than the sort of incentives to create. And the last thing we have to keep in mind is that there's no going back. I'm not here to tell you that if you do what I say, all our environmental problems go away and we're back in the garden of Eden. I can't sell you that. No one can sell you that. The reality is, is that human civilization, being able to have lectures like this, being able to have our phones, our iPods, our cars, the medicines we have, the things that improve our lives, make us live longer and healthier lives, that necessarily results in environmental impact. The question is not what set of principles or what set of policies can make these impacts go away, because no one can do that. The question is what set of principles and policies will do the best or really the least bad, maybe the tenth best, but the best that's attainable way of achieving the things we want at an environmental cost that that's acceptable. It's not necessarily the most uplifting message to end on, but I think it's always important to remember that there is no way to have human civilization without mass environmental impact. The question is what type of environmental impact, how much, and are we creating institutions and incentives that minimize it and that constantly create incentives for doing, doing better with what we have and solving problems as we go forward. I think if we approach environmental problems that way, we realize that focusing more on our institutions, trying to build on property rights, represent a better way of trying to solve these problems than assuming that answers come from regulations or come from Washington, D.C. I will stop there and I will take questions until Professor Knight tells me and I have to stop. So thank you very much.